In 2015, billionaire Elon Musk announced Starlink, a satellite-based internet provider that would put so many satellites into space that it caused alarm amongst astronomers. In 2018, Tesla, one of his companies, announced the ability to add air-powered rocket thrusters to their vehicles. And he's been very public about his desire to build a transformable submarine car. All I'm saying is that Elon isn't even trying to pretend that he doesn't want to be Batman. And so let me just put it out there, Elon. I volunteer to be your Robin. Here's my resume. Hello internet, welcome to Film Theory, where, one last note about Elon Musk, he might be trying to be Batman in real life, but did you know that he's actually the inspiration for Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man in the Marvelverse? Quote from an interview with Jon Favreau, the film's director. When I was trying to bring the character of genius billionaire Tony Stark to the big screen in Iron Man, I had no idea how to make him seem real. Robert Downey Jr. said, we need to sit down with Elon Musk. And, uh, the rest is history, friends. Anyway, today we're talking about everyone's other favorite eccentric billionaire, Bruce Wayne, aka The Batman, who recently got himself a bunch of new announcements. In case you missed them, since 2020 continues to suck and that suckitude includes things like Comic-Con being cancelled, DC took it upon themselves to host an entirely separate online event called Fandome, where they could update all of us about their new projects. We saw the Snyder Cut of Justice League, which, you know, looks like Justice League. We saw info about James Gunn's Suicide Squad 2, called THE Suicide Squad, which, you know, has gotta be the dumbest naming convention since the release of the Wii U but really does look like a cool project. There are some new video games coming out that look like a lot of fun. Wonder Woman's new movie still looks promising. But of course, the biggest news was the drop of a new teaser for the Batman. With its grounded world, realistic looking costumes, and dark atmosphere, the Batman is shaping up to be more of a detective noir film than any of the Bat's previous movies. Which is pretty exciting since, you know, Batman is supposed to be the world's greatest detective, but we rarely see that put to full use in the movies. Like, how cool is it that Batman can just casually stroll into a crime scene midday to work alongside the Gotham Police Department? And it seems like the movie has the perfect villain to match wits against him, the Riddler, making his long overdue cinematic appearance since um, riddle me that. Who's afraid of the big black bat? Was that over the top? I can never tell. Let's just say that this new Batman probably won't be featuring quite as many bedazzled question mark leotards. Now, loyal theorists subscribed to the channel will remember that last year we were able to predict many of the big twists of Joker a month before it was released into theaters. This time, I think we can do one better. I think that we can call many of the big plot points and reveals of the Batman a full year early. Using information from the trailer, what we know about the production, crew interviews, and just a little bit of general movie knowledge, I think we can pull a Batman for ourselves and solve the Riddler's game before the movie is even done with production. It'd be a new all-time record for us, I gotta say. So, what do you think? Wanna play? So last year when we did this dance for Joker, a lot of our conclusions were based on movies that the director listed as his stylistic inspirations. And, um, by inspirations, he really just meant ripping off entire plot points. In that case, it was the Martin Scorsese classic, King of Comedy, which hinted at the fact that not everything in the movie was going to be real, and that there was going to be a strong usage of hallucinations and dream sequences. Joker used a lot of the same mechanics, but hey, audiences didn't seem to mind that it was just king of comedy with a comic book skin over top of it, to the tune of earning one billion dollars worldwide. And so I don't think it's too much of a stretch to assume that DC saw that success and said, hey, let's do that again, shall we? This time, Matt Reeves, the director of The Batman, has already gone to list the movie Chinatown, a dark 1970s detective movie, as one of his primary inspirations for his film. And while Chinatown is a classic, and yes, I think that that movie's story of citywide corruption is probably a big inspiration for the Batman's plot. I mean, it is Gotham, after all. Corruption just kind of comes with the territory. I'm not gonna focus on that film today, because I think DC learned something from the last time that we did this dance. Because we were able to put so much together so early last time, I think DC might have told Matt Reeves to stay quiet about some of his more direct influences. Nice try, guys, but I see you. I've got it all figured out. Based on the scenes that we've been shown in the trailer, I believe that The Batman will follow the work of David Fincher, award-winning director behind psychological thriller movies like Seven and Zodiac. Because the stories behind both of these movies are so important to today's theory, I'm gonna briefly go over both. So here's a spoiler warning for both of these movies, Seven and Zodiac, one of which contains the most frequently spoiled movie moment in history. What's in the box? What's in the box? And let me just say 
if you've never seen these films, especially Seven, watch them. They're great. They're super influential in the genre of crime thrillers. Like, I'm just a big fan. Even if Seven does do that stupid thing where a number is supposed to be the letter. Like, seriously, doesn't even look like a V. Anyway, so Seven in tells the story of two detectives, Morgan Freeman and Brad Pitt. Uh, sorry, Somerset and Mills. It's just sometimes hard to separate these guys as anything but themselves. Anyway, Somerset is one week from retirement when the movie starts, and Mills is the relatively new guy who's supposed to take his place. Their first and only case together is to try and solve a string of serial killings based around the seven deadly sins, where the culprit, John Doe, leaves clues and riddles for the detectives to solve. Or fail to solve, quite honestly, because by the end of the movie, they totally fail to stop the killer. Seriously, he has to turn himself in. Realize, detective, the only reason that I'm here right now is that I want it to be. No. No, we would have got you eventually. Allowing five innocent people to die. And at the end of the movie, his plan is complete. There are seven victims, and he's played the detectives right into his own hands. We'll get into more specifics about the crimes in a minute. The other David Fincher movie I want to call out is Zodiac, based on the real story of the Zodiac Killer, a serial killer in California who sent a series of letters and riddled ciphers to California newspapers announcing his killings to the world. Hmm, more riddles, go figure. The movie comes down pretty hard on one suspect in particular, but much like the real-life case, the guy is never caught caught or convicted. He goes free. He wins. Rather than focusing on the guy who did it, the movie actually focuses on the people investigating the case and the massive toll that it took on their lives. Now, I'm not just calling out these movies because they're both gritty psychological thrillers that stylistically look very similar to the Batman trailer and feature detective characters trying to solve riddles sent by a deranged killer, though let's be honest, that's already a lot of similarities. No, what made me convinced enough to do a theory about this is the fact that industry insight have alluded to the fact that the Batman movie wouldn't just feature one villain, or two, or three, it might have six. Here's the quote from Hollywood Reporter's Heat Vision newsletter. Matt Reeves is still tweaking a script, which is rumored to have at least two villains, the Penguin being one of them, according to sources. One person is telling us there will be around half a dozen villains. We're hearing of another perfect character making an appearance in the script as well. Jeez, half a dozen? I mean, it seems like too many to believe. Has no one, no one learned anything from Spider-Man 3 or Amazing Spider-Man 2 or, well, really just a lot of Spider-Man movies with too many villains crammed in. It seems like this absolutely insane number of villains, but Matt Reeves himself has gone on record to say that the movie will feature a rogues gallery of villains, again implying a lot of characters here. And this seems to hold up when you look at what information we've gotten so far from the production. Riddler, Penguin, and Catwoman all feature in the trailer, so we know that that those three are definitely in there. We also know that John Tutero is cast as Carmine Falcone, who, well, not a supervillain per se, is often one of Batman's biggest villains. Rumors about Two-Face have also been swirling since the movie first started filming, and while no actor is definitely playing the character, Charlie and Max Carver are identical twins who are both cast in the movie in as-of-yet unnamed roles. Given Two-Face's common use of twins as henchmen, this casting doesn't seem like that much of a coincidence, and makes it likely that Two-Face will probably show his face somewhere. So already it seems Seems like you're dealing with five known villains, meaning that a sixth wouldn't be that far of a stretch. Now, I go over all of that because, including Batman, it would make seven key characters. It's an interesting number considering that seven function the same way. Six victims, and the seventh being the young Detective Mills, the one investigating the serial killings. And unlike all the other victims, Mills isn't killed. Instead, it's his idealism, his moral code that shattered at the end of the movie. Again, spoilers for for the movie, but the killer John Doe pushes Detective Mills to the brink by offing his wife and chipping her head in a box to the middle of the desert. Mills fires on the shackled and helpless John Doe, and in the process creates the final two victims in John Doe's masterwork, John and himself, representing envy and wrath. It's a story that slots perfectly in with a younger Batman, one who, based on interviews about the movie, is only in his second year of being a rodent-themed sleuth. Quote from Matt Reeves about the movie, the idea is that we're in year two. It's the Gotham experiment. It's a criminological experiment. He's trying to figure out sort of what he can do to finally change the place. And in our story, as he's in that mode, that's where you meet him. And he's seeing that he's not having any of the effect that he wants to have yet. And that is when the murders start to happen. So a young, more innocent and idealistic Batman is presented with a series of murders committed by the Riddler. And eventually, the last victim will be Batman himself, where his commitment or moral code is broken somehow. Don't believe me? In the 
trailer, Riddler directly calls out Batman. You're part of this too. How am I part of this? You'll see. It's eerily similar to an exchange that we get in Seven. So when this big thing happens, you be sure and let me know, because I wouldn't want to miss it. Oh, don't worry. You won't. You won't miss a thing. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think that we'll be following the seven deadly sins or anything literal like that, but I do think that the Riddler's goal in the Batman will be very similar to what we see of John Doe in Seven. The trailer shows us that the Riddler likes literally leaving writing on walls. Seven's killer also liked literally writing on the walls, clearly wanting to send a message with his murders. We see a deadly sin on every street corner. We tolerate it because it's common. Well, not anymore. And what I've done is gonna be puzzled over and studied forever. Sounds like a message that could also apply to Gotham, a city full of corruption and greed. As Matt Reeves says himself, The murders begin to describe sort of the history of Gotham, it opens up a whole new world of corruption that went much farther. Oh yeah, and then there's the music for the Batman trailer, Something in the Way. Not only is this a really great song, but it's also supporting this theory since it's a song by Nirvana, the iconic grunge band that exploded onto the scene and helped shape the course of music all through the 90s. It's a sound very much of that decade. And when was Seven released? 1995. Smack dab in the middle of the decade where Nirvana was at its height. Just call out what I see is an interesting coincidence. When asked about the comic book influences, Matt Reeve mentions Batman Ego, which was a dark story about the mental toll being a superhero takes on a human. It poses that classic Batman question, Can Bruce Wayne and Batman ever truly coexist? We'll find out today! Dang it, Joel Schumacher, I thought I told you to stay out of this. Anyway, Ego touches on Bruce's obsession with vengeance and justice, and how the costs can be immense. Likewise, both Seven and Zodiac deal with the passion and ultimate disillusionment of crime fighters. In Seven, Detective Somerset starts a week away from his retirement because he can't see the point in going on with what he's doing. By the end of the movie, he's kind of changed his mind. Ernest Hemingway once wrote, The world is a fine place and worth fighting for. I agree with the second part. Meanwhile, Detective Mills lets his passion take control, ultimately leading to his own ruin when he murders an unarmed prisoner. It feels like the dynamic between Jim Gordon, the hardened police officer, versus Batman's wild passion for justice. Vengeance. Okay, okay. Or vengeance. By the way, I wouldn't be surprised if this was the final scene in the movie where, very clearly, he just beat that guy to death, right? We can all agree that that guy is probably dead. And if Batman's moral code is, hey, I'm working with the detectives, I don't kill people, maybe this is Batman after his moral code's been broken and he's like, you know what? What? I'm gonna have to kill people. Just putting it out there as a hypothesis. Anyway, in Zodiac, it's the same thing. The main character, Robert Graysmith, starts as an innocent cartoonist, but over the course of the movie, devolves as he obsesses over the case, trying to solve the riddles, ignoring his wife, forcing his kids to work on solving the case with him, and ultimately putting his own life on the line to solve the crime. But what you may have noticed through all of this is that neither Zodiac nor Seven have particularly happy endings. In Zodiac, the killer gets away with it, and in Seven, the killer gets exactly what he wanted. Given that Batman is going up against one of his most brilliant villains, there's more than a good chance that the Riddler is going to wind up with what he wants too. And so that begs the question, what does he want? Well, outside of breaking the bat in a way that doesn't involve his back, I believe that he wants to dismember what's known as the Court of Owls. Remember how I said that there was one last slot open for another supervillain? Well, I think it might all be tied to a group of villains known as the Court of Owls. The Court of Owls is this shady cabal of Gotham's wealthiest citizens who actively influence crime in the city for their own benefit. In the comics, the Waynes were always fighting against the Court of Owls, and it wouldn't be much of a super stretch to guess that maybe the Court of Owls was tied to the death of Batman's parents. You know, I always make fun of movies for showing the Batman origin story for like the thousandth time, but it is really hard to talk about Batman and not talk about his parents' murder. Or, as Matt Reeves put it when talking about his movie, without being an origin tale for him, it ends up being something that touches on his origins. In fact, the Court of Owls is actually hinted at by the card that the Riddler Riddler leaves for Batman, which features an owl backed by a skeleton. We see Batman actually beating that skeleton later in the teaser, so that card might be more literal than it first appears. It's also worth calling out that the Court of Owls has a peculiar penchant for kidnapping young boys and transforming them into murder ninjas called Talons. Hmm, young boys who grow up to become murder ninjas. Where have I heard that one before? Talons get themselves a cool uniform that has a hood and goggles that looks awfully similar to Riddler's goggled face mask from the trailer. But I think Riddler wasn't a successful Talon. I think he escaped and he wants vengeance. The card Riddler left for Batman is from your 
secret friend, which indicates that at least Riddler sees himself as an ally for Batman's cause. So we have ourselves one person who's trying to solve Gotham's crime problem violently in the Riddler, and another person who's probably trying to solve it in a less violent way in Batman. And by the end of the movie, Batman has to change his moral code. Since the Court of Owls is actively making crime worse in the city, taking them out, even if violently, may actually help solve Gotham's crime problem, which is exactly what Matt Reeves claims Batman is trying to do. He's trying to figure out what he can do that can finally change this place. So in the end, here is how I see the movie The Batman playing out. Six crimes, with the seventh victim being Batman himself. The Riddler's goal through his murders is to bring light to the corruption of Gotham. Corruption led by the Court of Owls. And in the process, get Batman to question his own moral code by exposing the Wayne family's role in all of it. Or potentially exposing that Batman himself was the product of the Court of Owls. That revelation shatters Batman, which leads him to breaking his own code in the end, ultimately killing someone, perhaps even the Riddler himself, thereby making Batman a vigilante rather than a trusted member of the detective squad. Oh, and uh, I also predict there will be zero appearances of bejeweled Riddler suits. So, am I right? Am I wrong? Looks like we're gonna have to find out in, um, 3071? 1091? 2061? Based on how 2020 has been going, that last riddle might be the most unsolvable of them all. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. Riddle me this, how can you help Film Theory cross 10 million subscribers stat? The answer to that one is actually shockingly easy. You just click the red subscribe button down below. Ring the bell if you want to get notified, but no skin off my nose if you don't. I just really want to cross 10 million subscribers on this channel one day soon. I think it deserves it. This channel works really hard. We work really hard on this. And hey, if nothing else, if this theory ends up not being true, just consider this your own personal headcanon. An alternate, equally viable route for how this movie could go. Will it be better? Will it be worse? I don't know. But it's worth subscribing to find out.